it's, I think, quite clear there are lots of other ways that we know now that there is no evidence, with the exception of one or two cell types, that genetic information is lost during development. And it is possible to clone adults, but only in some mammal uh, species, not all mammals, remember, uh, but not amphibians. And the process of this reprogramming is really not understood. Again, just briefly, in, pa in passing, mention the potential value or the real value of this uh, technique of nuclear transfer. Without any doubt, the biggest impact is that it gave you knowledge and stimulated, among others, Shinya Yamanaka to think of this experiment to reprogram uh, cells. It was the birth of Dolly which uh, triggered him to, to look for ways of reprogramming cells to produce embryo stem cells. Our original objective at Roslyn was actually to be able to make precise genetic changes in, in animals and there is a practical value of that which relates to regenerative medicine. It's actually been mentioned by one or two people who shouldn't cross in a day. This is work done uh, in the States by a, 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 a consortium working in uh, Missouri, I think, as far as animals are concerned, where they've introduced the mutations associated with cystic fibrosis into pigs. Um, there are, are, there have been mice modeling the disease for a very long time, but they are physiologically so different that they're not a good model. And of course, being very small, they're not really very easy to work with. The advantage of pigs is that it does seem that the abnormalities in the animals, the animals, are very similar, more so than in the mouse, to the abnormalities seen in newborn children that have the disease. Um, and of course, being much larger, it will be easier to do repeated observations or repeated treatments of. Uh, organs like the, the, uh, the lung. It may very well be that as um, people in this room develop treatments for cell therapy or for drugs which might be used to treat uh, human disease, that uh, livestock which have been uh, genetically modified in this way um, will provide a, an invaluable model. I think particularly if there's a, a weight issue or particular physiological uh, things that are interfering with, they may be far, far better than so enough of cloning. Um, I was interested to discover when I was talking to Rudy Yenish uh, yesterday that neither of our labs now do nuclear transfer. Um, it's something which was so important to us at a different stage, but, but not, not anymore. He's the only person who can do the technique. I'm afraid I, I don't. <laughs> The reason I'm afraid is that I've got a very good experiment I could do it now. <laughs> That's frustrating. The second approach to changing the fate of cells that I want to discuss is clearly introducing uh, specific proteins and looking to see what, what happens. And there's a little history to that, not nearly as long as with the, the cloning. But a critical experiment, uh, 1986, uh, the reference is shown at the bottom of the slide, where the question was asked, what, what happens if you put a single dominant transcription factor into uh, cells? Is it able to change the cells? And the result, I think, summarized fairly clearly here. The transcription factor myOD is a critical factor in the formation of muscle. And if you put it into cells which are of the mesoderm lineage, the single gene um, is able to turn dermal fibroblasts into muscle. In that case, just a single gene has that a dominant effect. On the other hand, if the cell that was being treated was from a different germ layer, either um, ectoderm or endoderm, it, it isn't able to have that, that effect. In itself, I think, uh, quite a, an important experiment. It leads naturally, that idea, the cloning idea, leads naturally, certainly when you look back, um, to Shinius of the experiment. Um, where he showed the, the, the introduction of just four carefully selected transcription factors into cells is capable of changing a small proportion of them to the cell type from which you've taken the transcription factors, in this case, induced by a potent cell. But there are a number of strange things about this procedure. I mean, it's wonderful. I think his experiment is certainly one of the most important of this past decade may very well be one of the most important this century, so please don't misunderstand me. But it, it does have a number of edges to it, a number of loose ends. 
Some of them are a little bit different from the ones which are usually mentioned, like using the retroviruses, which have uh, an integration uh, site, is a significant disadvantage. Um, there's a variation in the expression of them. Um, these sort of things is often mentioned. I don't think some of these things are not usually mentioned. <coughs> Partial reprogramming, I think, is mentioned. That you get cells which begin to go down this process, but don't quite go all the way to reprogramming. But a number of groups have noticed that during the early phases of this production of induced polypotent cells, there's a whole zoo of different cell types there. And if you pick them out carefully, you can actually isolate uh, cells which have a, an appropriate, a different, a different uh, phenotype. So Mickey Batchia's lab in, in Canada, Canada picked out multiple hemopoietic cells from that pool and characterized them fairly well. Um, as well as using the full range of the four young marker factors, he also showed that the same thing could be achieved if you only introduced OP4. So, so the sequence is that you put in the uh, transcription factors and then you change the cells to the medium which you think is appropriate for that particular cell type you're picking out. So as these multipotent cells were picked out and they could give rise to different cell lineages but not the lymphoid lineage. So these are not true hemopoietic stem cells, so multipotent cell type. He showed that they were capable of engraftment in, in vivo. Um, he also showed that they had not gone through a pluripotent stage on the way of getting there. This is a direct hop from a fibrous population to a hemopoietic uh, progenitor. We did the same thing, um, which is not published, um, picking up neural stem cell progenitors from the same mix and found, as he did, that OP4 was capable of doing it on its own. There was an increase in efficiency and speed of the process if, if you put Mick in as well, uh, but OP4 was the only one which could do it all on its own. Um, we did not show that the cells could function physiologically. We grew them out, maintained them in culture for a long time, got different neural lineages, but did not take it any further than that. So there's something slightly strange going on. The situation isn't being controlled quite as accurately as you might hope in this early stage of reprogramming. No doubt lots of people began to think, well, if this will work, taking fibroblasts and going to pluripotent cells, can we find the factors which will enable us to go to other cell types? And many of you probably know that there are at least two papers, the references are cited briefly on the slide, where people have changed fibroblasts into either a neural population or into cardiomyocytes um, in the mouse. Um, with a low efficiency, but they did manage to get the cells to go to a different phenotype. 